now, now diving into the realm of the imbalance, you know, when, when things don't work so well, a uh, very simple uh, uh, equation from the standpoint of thought, and that is if you're producing CSF at a constant rate, and as I mentioned, there's rare exceptions to that. Most of this is on the circulatory or on the absorptive side of this. But when that imbalance takes place, uh, that's what's referred to as hydrocephalus, a very common congenital problem. You know, the, the incidence of this has dropped a lot, certainly in the course of my career with better perinatal care and the, the premature infants and the early gestational age from reduction of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. But the congenital version is, is alive and, and well. Again, we've seen some reduction with regard to a great reduction in myelodysplastic syndromes, just because of the high association with the spinal dysraphism. But nevertheless, you know, I, I think most of us would say that you know, maybe this is down to 40%. <laughs> Depends on what week you're on call. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a lot of our effort is put into reestablishing a balance of what's happening with regard to CSF circulation. Uh, you can see some numbers there. I'm sure they're outdated. And I'm sure with the price of shunts skyrocketing with programmable systems and diagnostics, uh, I'm sure that's quadrupled by now. And it would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, from the standpoint of treatment, very important. Uh, this is not just a, uh, a, an exercise in academics. And I remember as a fellow at Sick Kids in Toronto, um, Derek Harwood Nash, who has now passed away, a real giant in neuroimaging, uh, always referred to this as uh, you know, non communicating hydrocephalus and uh, communicating or obstructive hydrocephalus on the non communicating side. All forms of hydrocephalus, he'd say, are non-communicating, but one is intraventricular and one is extraventricular. So it depends where that obstruction is. So on the communicating side, uh, you know, the obstruction is really at those, if you can think about it simply, at the arachnoidal granulations, at the resorptive aspect. Non-communicating, what we're talking about is the ventricular system is not communicating with the subarachnoid space. These become extremely important from the standpoint of what we have to offer. And you're gonna hear a lot about that by Dr. DePatria, I think, uh, in two weeks. Um, but from the standpoint of, uh, you know, you see some examples here that I'll, that I'll show you some in a moment. I use these uh, now outdated, you know, cartoons that I thought was really cool using way back when. Uh, communicating means, again, you know, the ventricular system communicates with the subarachnoid space. There's no interventricular obstruction. So once it gains access to the subarachnoid space, pressure is increased, you get a lack of resorption. On the adult side, the most common cause is depicted here, one of the most common causes, and that's subarachnoid hemorrhage, seen on this axial CT. This is all hyperdense blood in the subarachnoid spaces in the cisterns. Here's an aneurysm, what's called the anterior communicating artery, pathologic substrate. But you, you, get a, you get a sense of how dense that blood is at the subarachnoid level and how problematic that is from resorbing, from resorbing that CSF. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, very big one. Meningitis, very big one. Infections and carcinomatous meningitis. Here, here is an example of just that. Now, this is post-resection of a tumor, but this is a form of communicating hydrocephalus that I just mentioned in passing. This is an MRI scan after treatment of a tumor. What you see on this MRI scan of the spine as well as the brain, this is not supposed to be this white line here. You know, this white line is contrast uptake for tumor that is spreading the subarachnoid space. And when it gains access to the subarachnoid space, like blood, it's going to stop the resorptive capacity of that subarachnoid space, and you end up with this globally raised intraventricular and subarachnoid pressure. I mentioned this exception, uh, one of my favorite tumors to treat, even though they're challenging, uh, choroid plexus tumors. Here you see one in the atria, one in the body of the lateral ventricles. This is a sagittal MR with contrast. This is a T2, so they've got kind of an inverse uh, grayscale image of the ventricular system, depending on what sequence we use. Uh, this is a choroid plexus tumor in the atria. So we're not obstructing CSF anywhere. The third ventricle is wide open, the aqueduct is open, the foramina are wide open. But you see this tumor that's overproducing CSF with this overabundance of CSF in the interventricular compartment. You, you, you take these out, you embolize them, and the, the CSF uh, uh, production goes dramatically uh, in, in a reverse direction. Um, so that's the one exception with overproduction. Revisiting this illustration with this dark mass situated in what's called the mesencephalon, now the aqueduct that we normally see between the third and the fourth ventricle, that two to three millimeter chamber, chamber is absent. It's compressed, it's deformed, 
CSF can't bypass that. Usually most forms of this are gradual, so it's kind of a slow uh, process, but when something's rapidly growing or a hemorrhage, this becomes absolute. Intraventricular pressure goes up dramatically. Subarachnoid space volume goes down and the patient uh, suffers. A really good example that I see a lot in my practice because of my passion in intraventricular tumor work and endoscopy, something called a colloid cyst, uh, which is right here, perfectly situated, not just for the endoscopist, but perfectly situated to block CSF between the lateral and third ventricles at the foramen of Monroe. Um, uh, these can happen rapidly. You, know, you see these patients deteriorate. Sudden death is a very, very common manifestation of this disease. Um, but this spherical mass here causing a form of obstructive hydrocephalus. Here you get a great view of the aqueduct, by the way. See that? And it's open. The fourth is open, normal in size. The lateral ventricle is blocked. Why? Because everything upstream, upstream from the site of obstruction is greatly dilated. Uh, here's an endoscopy view of it. Uh, this is what's called the fornix, the choroid plexus. And you see this semi-transparent membrane you might not appreciate, which is the wall of this colloid cyst blocking all CSF pathways <clears throat> between the lateral and third ventricle, excuse me. I got a sip of my beer here too. Another form of non-communicant hydrocephalus we see a lot um, at the level of the tectum that I described before, congenital forms, uh, neoplastic varieties, big lateral ventricle, big third, tiny fourth, obstructive hydrocephalus or non-communicating hydrocephalus. One really important issue to talk about with regard to uh, hydrocephalus and any form of intracranial pressure issues. When you get a backup of fluid, um, the brain and the, and the body in general have a very good ability to compensate for this for a certain period of time. But unlike the abdominal cavity, when you can see large masses, uh, an intestinal obstruction, uh, hemorrhage, really accommodate liters and liters or cubic liters of, of mass can't happen in the brain. You, know, you don't have that rapid compensation, but more importantly, this is a closed structure and there is no ability for things to distend as much as they do in other body cavities. So this idea that inside the cranial compartment is fixed with some exception, it, you, it's not as if your, your brain can be expended from the standpoint of release of tissue. CSF to some degree, blood, venous blood primarily to some degree, uh, and those are the things that, that may help with this compensatory process. The Monroe-Kelly doctrine dictates that with an increase in pressure, there's got to be a compensatory decrease in another to maintain a static normal intracranial pressure. And hence, perfusion, namely your blood to get into the parenchymal compartment of the, of the head or the brain. So in the Monroe-Kelly uh, doctrine, you have this compensatory phase uh, relationship between intracranial pressure and volume, that is, you increase volume, and I don't know what these increments are, probably five or 10 cc's. As you increase the volume, you keep a relatively normal steady state of intracranial pressure up to about 20 uh, cubic, uh, 20 millimeters of mercury up to about here. And look what happens after that, uh, excuse me, after that five, 10, 15, 20 cc incremental increase. Now it's a very rapid increase in pressure. So things compensate for some period of time and per volume of whatever that is that's being introduced into the brain, CSF, blood, tumor, you get a rapid, rapid acceleration of uh, ICP. And this becomes extremely important. And that gives you really good insight as to how acute something is as well. So somebody comes to you with very large ventricles and you think they should be dead, it probably gives you an indication they've been compensating for a long time and adjusting things like parenchymal water content. Another compensatory system that we see on the pediatric side quite a bit, especially in the young kids, is the idea for the calvarium to expand and the fontanelles to decompress pressure. So as you, again, tumor, CSF from hydrocephalus or anything for that matter, an increase in pressure is typically transmitted in the kid uh, to allow these, uh, these sutures to, uh, to separate. Uh, and this not just happens in the young kids, this can happen in older kids. Um, an example of a child here with relatively late uh, recognized hydrocephalus, you know, very typical manifestations. Age plays a really, really important role as far as their ability to compensate for a long period of time. I've listed some of the symptoms you'll see in adolescents and adults from the standpoint of acuity. Um, infants, it's uh, much different and a lot more difficult to treat. You know? So anybody who's done or will do pediatric rotations, 
you know, if you've got your tape measure in your pocket, you know, why are we measuring the head? You, know? <laughs> you are because in the rare situation where someone has, a child has something that's increasing, usually uh, CSF uh, volume, uh, whether it be a cyst or, or a hydrocephalus, it's, a, it's one of the earliest signs for it, even before they start to decompensate with things like irritability and poor feeding. Um, but those are, those are key players as well. Uh, the gaze paralysis, very classic. Uh, you see this uh, child with what looks like bulging eyes. It's due to frontal compensation, but they have a real difficulty in upward gaze and uh, conjugate upward gaze. See so engorgement of the scalp veins here, uh, again, because of the increasing venous pressure with transmission of fluid into the venous system. Very, very typical. As I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a, an infant. This very large tumor that I operated on earlier this year, interestingly on the CT scout, uh, you know, this is not normal. I think this child was probably five or six. If you look at the diastasis of these cranial sutures. It's a compensatory mechanism um, very late, uh, even though this kid was beyond, well beyond a year of age. You get these separation of sutures. It's, a, it's the body's ability to try and compensate for increasing pressure, but very large degree of hydrocephalus, blockage of the outlet of the fourth due to this big tumor. So compensation happens up to a certain point, then, then you kind of uh, are in an emergent situation. And fortunately for us today, and again, anybody who reads historical textbooks in neurosurgery, you know, you're frightened by this idea of looking at pneumoencephalograms and angiograms and trying to diagnose hydrocephalus. There's nothing hidden today. You know, MR does not lie, and it gives you an amazing ability to visualize alterations in the ventricular compartment. And it takes a little bit of a trained eye, but I think anybody listening to this talk can look at this versus this and say, hey, you know, the ventricles are substantially larger. You know, what is norm? What is the threshold? Uh, of course, there's a lot of discussion points to go into that. But 2D imaging with CT or MR is extremely important. It's kind of our, our workhorse for looking at ventricular enlargement. There are standardized methods for doing this, and these are validated uh, that above certain thresholds, and they're fairly tight with regard to their variance, as you can see here, are extremely reliable for objectifying whether or not ventricular enlargement, I won't say hydrocephalus, I just say ventricular enlargement exists, it tells you nothing about pressure. It tells you something about ventricular size, which essentially is a very good surrogate for most purposes of hydrocephalus. Um, but then you can see on this what's called flare-related image, this bright white signal, which is essentially looking at in real time CSF that's being pushed out of the ventricle into the parenchymal compartment. I'm starting to accelerate my pace a little bit so I can get you guys out on time. Volumetric assessment has become an almost push button today where you put a cursor in an area of interest, uh, segment out the volume of CSF in the ventricular system and even the subarachnoid space to give you very good longitudinal measurements, uh, which is uh, extremely important. Um, from the standpoint of two-dimensional measurements, I've talked about the objective uh, aspects of this. Um, you know, here, again, I, I show this because of the, the elegance with regard to what uh, MR can, can depict. This is what's called a T1-weighted image. This is a T2-weighted image, and you know, there are neuroimaging individuals are very good at manipulating the sequences in MR to subtract out or include certain uh, things that we are very interested in looking at. And this shows beautifully uh, an, an example of how uh, CSF motion now is quite readily imaged with MR. So you see this white CSF, it's called a T2 image, and it, this signal dropout, you get this kind of uh, jet of fluid going through this very reduced chamber called the aqueduct. So as velocity increases, it drops out in signal like you do in the basilar artery. So you can start to now use MR to look at flow, not just volume of CSF. Um, this high definition MR you know, shows beautifully these small little things that we would never see with CT. Commonly, these patients are misdiagnosed because you don't have this uh, level, level of resolution on CT and a lot of MR sequences of something blocking the aqueduct. So um, these are extremely, extremely important tools. I was talking about directional movement of CSF, you know, something called a phase contrast or cine imaging. Um, you know, the, the, for the untrained person who doesn't look at this, ah, it looks like a blurry image of the brain. I can't tell what is what. Here's the cerebellum. Here's the brain stem. Here's the spinal cord. But what we're looking at here is not the parenchymal compartment. This is the subarachnoid space in back of and in front of the spinal cord and brain stem. 
here coming out of the fourth ventricle. And what we're visualizing here is really something in and out of phase with regard to direction of movement. So this is CSF flowing in one direction, uh, turning black, and then 180 degrees opposed in the opposite direction, it turns black. Those are the opposites. So black and white gradient. Um, and this really drives home that point I was making before as far as this pulsatility. It's not unidirectional. So this idea that it's flowing literally with every heartbeat is, is quite dramatic. So we use this for looking at patency at small areas like the aqueduct, the fourth ventricular outlet. It becomes an important tool. Hasn't been limited to you know, the, the postnatal time period. Our, our imaging capacity in the unborn child is becoming extremely, extremely detailed um, to the point where we have an MR now in our neonatal ICU, but uh, maternal fetal medicine is blossoming with regard to the diagnostics. This helps a lot with prognos prognostication for the unborn child and really serves as a very important tool for us to partner with our high-risk OBs to have conversations with parents, but you know, certainly in this situation can easily diagnose hydrocephalus. Um, uh, one comment I did make about the difference between ventriculomegaly or ventricular enlargement and hydrocephalus. I, I think about these and I stress you think about these in two different domains. Uh, large ventricles don't always mean blockage of fluid. It doesn't always mean hydrocephalus that needs to be treated. You get a great idea here that is due to loss of parenchymal substrate. You know, this I can tell you and you can easily see that this gyral pattern of the brain is so much more exaggerated. Look at the increased subarachnoid space. There's a lot of loss of white matter. We don't have to go into the pathology why, but with brain atrophy, you get an increase in the CSF volume, both intraventricular and subarachnoid space, not under pressure versus something like this. Uh, which is clearly obstructive. No subarachnoid space, things look tight. And on certain sequences, you'd see some element of transependymal signal change. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.